Okay, guys, we're here today with John Danaher, huge honor for me, Placido. And uh, guys, John just finished shooting the seventh part of the New Wave series, which is all about mount attacks and mount control, right, John? Yeah. yeah. So can you explain um, a little more? I'm actually really looking forward to this one. Um, from the time my students started uh, competing and grappling, they were mostly known as people who came out, pulled bottom position, guard position, and worked lower body submissions. And uh, for the longest time, I think people had the impression that was all that we teach. And then they were rather surprised when uh, many of my students uh, started switching their emphasis from bottom position, lower body attacks to top position, upper body attacks. Um, in general, I have a philosophy of coaching submission grappling, which puts the emphasis on bottom position. You attack the lower body first, everything else second and top position, you focus on passing first and upper body submissions first and lower body second. That's the, the breakdown. It, the, obviously, obviously there are exceptions to that rule, but that's the general philosophy that I coach. Um, so people were surprised when they saw that, in fact, my students are very powerful pinners. Once they get to side control and work their way into mounted position, their submission percentage is just as high in the upper body top as it is in lower body bottom half of the body. So um, uh, this caught a lot of people by surprise, I think, and changed their perceptions of our coaching program. I wanted to show in this video exactly what I show my students, um, what makes them effective for, uh, once they've passed an opponent's guard and gotten to top pins, what makes them able to get to the mount, what makes them able to uh, enact this extraordinarily high submission rate from mounted position. Um, and a good way to, to couch this for your, for your viewers is in terms of how, how does the amount of position work in the sport of jiu-jitsu? Because you know, the first day you come into the class, what's the first thing they teach you? Get past your opponent's legs, yep, work yep, your way through the pins yep, and get yep, to the mount. Okay, yep. okay that makes sense. Why? Um, well, when you look at it, uh, jiu-jitsu as it was originally conceived was inextricably linked to self-defense and fighting. Yep. And the whole central idea of pinning in jiu-jitsu was that pinning was allied with striking that the the whole idea of what makes a pin valuable in jiu-jitsu is that you can get to a position where you can hit people and once you start hitting them they go into defensive reactions they turn they put arms up which makes submission easy the greatest cliche in jiu-jitsu the one you hear more than anything else is that you get position first and submission second and as long as you're engaged in the action of striking out of pins that makes perfect sense but then something interesting happens. You get situations where you take the striking out and you build the sport of just pure grappling. And now you've got to start looking at pins differently. Now you're looking at situations where you get to positions like the mount, you can't hit people on grappling, obviously. So where does the submission come from? If your opponent's got skills, he's not going to panic. He's, going to, he's, he's been mounted plenty of times before. He's going to keep his elbows in. He's going to keep his body compact. And now you can get the position, but when it's what time to convert it yeah. into a submission, it's it's a lot harder than you thought. You yeah. say, this guy's not giving you anything for free, and now he knows how to escape. He's he's got his elbows inside your knees, and it's like, oh my god, like I get these positions, I can I can hold people down, I can, but I can't finish people. And then you see someone like Gordon Ryan, almost every time he gets mounted, he's finishing. He's converting yeah. the pin to a submission. Yeah, I have seen Gordon fighting as uh, some of the highest guys that it's the hardest to stay on the mount yes. like Mateus for example yes. one of the people that I train the most and uh, he has something different about the mount no gi you yes. know like that, yes. uh, that's very rare to find I, I I really wanted to um portray that in this video um like, like I don't think a lot of people understand how difficult it is to stay mounted on someone who's a world champion like Mateus like yep. they, it, it's like trying to ride a mechanical bull. It, yeah, it's really yeah, difficult. Yeah. And then suddenly you got Gordon who can stay there for literally five, six, seven minutes at a time with no problems. And you've got to ask yourself, okay, well, what is he doing differently? Like, we all know what the mount position is, but one guy's doing it differently. Yeah, yeah. What's the secret? Um, now, when we get back to that idea that in Jiu Jitsu, as it was originally conceived, pinning and striking were completely tied together. Suddenly you've got submission grappling where pinning and striking kept apart, how are you gonna, how are you gonna start to, uh, attacking people successfully? A lot of people just abandon the mount. 
uh, if you talk to a lot of modern athletes in the sport, they say, hey, if I'm not allowed to punch someone, it's not worth it to me to get, to get mounted. If there's no points for getting mounted in submission grappling, it's not worth it. I'm better off staying in side control, it's more yeah. stable, yeah. And, and just submit them from there. Yeah, enjoy, especially against your team, because the, the mount becomes dangerous becomes when the personal dangerous. warrior is very yeah. good at the heel yeah. hooks and that yeah. kind of stuff. Every time he gets out, your legs yeah. are open for yeah. attack. Yeah. So it's like doubly hard in that yeah. situation. So there's a lot of feeling now that, uh, you know what, if strikes aren't involved, dude, I'm, I'm better off just staying in side control and working from there. And you see a lot of people do take that philosophy. But that's where things start getting interesting. The two greatest grapplers I ever saw in my life were no, Gordon Ryan and Hodger Gracie. No, I never saw anyone better than those two, okay? And yet, what did they both have in common? A very strong mount position. Every time they pass the guard, they're never satisfied with side control. They always get mounted, even when points aren't involved. So you got to ask yourself, why do the two best of all time insist on the mounted position under all circumstances? And neither one of those guys gives a damn about points. Okay, Hodger doesn't care about winning by points. He doesn't, he, Gordon certainly doesn't. For them, it was all about submitting people. Why did the two best guys of all time insist on the mounted position and were never satisfied just with side control or north-south or something like that? That's a fascinating question. Now, if you look at it, they had different solutions to the problem of mount. They both focused on the mount, but Hodge's mount philosophy was mostly based around his gi game and the use of collars. He could put pressure on people through the collars that created reactions and his whole game came off that. Gordon does it in the no-gi context. Okay, now because this is a no gi video and because I'm Gordon's coach, um, I wanted to show the system that I use, that I taught to Gordon, and which he uses so successfully from top position mount. This is the four by four mount system. The idea is when Jiu Jitsu first started and pinning and striking were closely allied, the idea is when you got to the mount, you use the pressure of striking to create panic reactions that open people up for submissions. Now, you gotta ask yourself, how do you create panic reactions when you're not allowed to strike? Hodger did it through the collars. How are we gonna do it with no gi? And the answer is, you attack his breathing. You attack his breathing. If the guy can't breathe, they start to panic. I don't care how good they are. They're no longer thinking about, how am I gonna get out of the mouth? You're thinking about where am I going to get my next fucking breath? When they're thinking in those terms, they start panicking, you start getting reactions where arms get extended, people turn their back, and life becomes a lot easier when you're hunting for submission holds. The way you attack their breathing from the mouth is very interesting. When you attack the breathing from the mouth and the single greatest advantage of the mounted position over side control is that you can make a direct attack on the passage of ear to the lungs through the nose and the mouth because the alignment of the mouth head to head sorry the alignment of the mouth head to head enables you to use your chest to cover their nose and mouth and when they can't breathe it's easy to submit people it's easy to control them let's have a look at how this might work I'm curious, Rob. yes okay if i'm across someone's side i can put a lot of mechanical pressure on them with things like cross faces I can attack their breathing through their diaphragm and lungs, okay? So for example, if I have an underhook on someone and draw it in and I put my elbow over someone like so and I put weight over their body, I can attack Placido's breathing through the lungs, but it's an indirect attack. There's nothing going, there's nothing physically blocking his airway, okay? It's uncomfortable and you can hear Placido's having a hard time breathing because I'm, I'm literally putting a big percentage of my body weight over his lungs, but it's an indirect attack. It's an attack on his ability to, to expand his ribcage, okay? Now compare that with the mounted position. Now, because I'm lined up with my training partner, I can use the mobility of switching between standard mounted positions where my feet are below his hips to high mounted positions where my knees start coming up into his armpits. What we need is a means of getting my chest over an unprotected face where the nostrils and mouth get covered. 
Okay? Our standard means of doing this is to create situations where I can get to an underhook. So in the 4x4 system, the first thing is to establish an underhook. Once we come in on a training partner, there's many ways to do this, I'll show this in the video, but most of them involve exposing our training partner's tricep. Once we get to a tricep, even when he tries to return the arm back down, you've got that underhook, it won't be easy. Now we get head control. From head control, we lift, expose the shoulder, we now have a full cross face, okay? The cross face involves gripping the lat muscle, not the side of the neck. Now, arm down ready. Now, from here, I have the standard mount. I often go to a closed standard mount with the feet locked, just like so. And as he tries to bring his arm in defensively, our whole thing is to start that finger walking action. Bringing our training partner's arm up, using the movement of my head to lever his arm. I never just use my arm alone, make a strong arm pass here. My arm alone will never move his elbow. It's the movement of my head and torso, which enables us to progressively bring his elbow up above the shoulder line and get to step two. Once we get to step two, we have to expose our training partner's head to our hand, just like so. Now, I lift his head off the floor and get to my own elbow. Now from this position, I need to clear his arm off my back. So we hit the shoulder shrug, where I turn my body and shrug my shoulder. And as a result, I now have his head caught in this chest wrap position. I have a single arm and a chest wrap. Now I walk my chest forward and I convert into a high mount, like so. I place my whole chest over Placido's face and bring my head down so that my feet can go underneath his back. Now, Placido is trying to breathe and can't. No, sorry, sorry. So we get a complete closure. Now, bear in mind, fellas, that Placido started this exercise in a state of relaxation. So his breathing was fine. Now picture this in the 12th minute yeah, of yeah, a hard fight yeah, where yeah. you're already exhausted. And completely and, desperate and, trying to escape. And you and can't breathe. Yeah. Okay, what do you think people start doing? Yeah. They start turning their back. Yeah. They start giving up. Okay? Giving arms, yeah. And because we have the arm above the shoulder, it's gonna be very easy for us now to engage in angular change, okay? Once we lock up on a training partner, some of our attacks don't involve angular change. So for example, Karagatame can just stay locked, linked up with my training partner. But many of them do, okay? And as we come up on a training partner, we'll start turning in on training partners and going into angular change off to the side, where we can go in and get finishes, okay? Oh, well, John, that's amazing, because uh, when I see Warren compete, that's exactly what he does, like, yeah. exactly, like, you're, you're picturing him. Yeah. Our general point is this, Bernardo. Historically, pinning in Jiu Jitsu, as, as the great cliche goes, submission first, sorry, uh, position first, submission second, was based around pressure. But the pressure was from striking. Okay, if you're mounted on someone in a fight situation, the pressure that you're looking for under these circumstances is always based on the idea of striking. And it's from there that people start putting arms up defensively. That's when you see these overreactions where people, they turn their body as they go to turn from these situations. That's when the back becomes available. That's when the arms become available. Yep. So historically, that was always the method. Then you take out striking, the guy just hunkers down, and you're like, dude, I got mounted. Uh, how, how the fuck am I gonna submit this guy? Okay. And the whole thing is to create situations where we can walk people up and get to positions like so. Once his elbow comes above his shoulder line, you can take the head. Once you can take the head, you can take your own elbow. Once you can take your own elbow, you can shrug his shoulder by. Once you can shrug the shoulder by, you can go high mount. Once you can go high mount, you can put your own forehead on the floor and stop him from breathing. Once you stop him from breathing, you're gonna get panic turns. As he turns, yeah. Suddenly, you've got finishes. Okay. okay. No, that's and for the first time, you can create the same kind of pressure yep. by threatening the breathing that you can from violence of striking yep. in a fight situation. And that's amazing, John. And John, I have one question for you. Yes. So, plus, you can lay down. So, last time Warren came here, he showed me one of the most fascinating things that I ever learned from him. And I yes. just saw you doing too. 
and the uh, and it's the concept of using the hand like this to That's push cool. her. Yeah. And in the very beginning of this video, you were comparing him and and the Roger. And coincidence or not, that's how Voyager starts his attack from yes. one as well, right? So, but instead of going here, he goes to the collar. Voyager Ho goes to the collar, yeah. and we go to the wrist. Yeah. But it's the same grip. It's the same grip. Yeah. Huh. Now, what's the first move you ever learned in Jiu-Jitsu from the mount? It's probably the American log, yeah. right? Yeah. No gear is probably the American log, and with a gear, it's probably the cross collar. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. And, and yet, the most two most advanced guys in the world use the same move that you learn on your first day in Jiu-Jitsu. Because essentially, what we're doing is we're doing a fake American log. I yeah. get it, but we're mixing up with this the with this grip, right? Because you know, I never, I had never seen the concept of doing this. I knew like doing this, yes. doing, yes. but never like yeah, four correct. fingers. Yeah. Yeah. Think about it. your first day in jiu-jitsu. You're generally being encouraged to attack someone who has no skills. Okay, so you got mounted on that they have no skills. So under those circumstances, it's fine to use a grip like this. Okay, now you go at world championship level against someone who's very strong and very skilled. Yep. If I go here, my hand just slips off, like strong. Yep. Okay? Yep. I'm never gonna move someone's arm this way. Yep. So you want the one grip that won't slip. So we come to the end of the lever, don't grab the wrist, that's not the end of the lever. Don't grab the hand, because the hand can move. Grab half hand, half wrist. Man, everything is so, so well calculated. Here. Okay, yep. that won't slip. Now from here, this is like an American lock. What am I pushing against? The rotator cuff muscles. If I push here, I'm pushing against the chest. If I try to pull here, I'm pulling against the lat muscles. They're strong as hell. So I take the rotator cuff muscles and I expose the tricep. Yeah. Once the tricep's exposed, at world championship level, you think you're gonna get an American lock? Of course not. It's too yeah. easy to escape. But you can get an underhook. And then you're- uh, Once you get the underhook, easy. then you lift and expose the lat. Now he's Man, probably going to explosively bridge, so I put my head on the floor for base. And from here we start walking, walking, patiently finding the shoulder line. Once I find the shoulder line, I find the head. Once I find the head, I find the elbow. Once I find the elbow, shoulder shrug. Then I find high mouth. So when he goes to bridge, bridge, I barely feel it. He goes to elbow escape, it's physically impossible. He goes to kip, it's impossible. Now from here, you can just suffocate it. Man, that's incredible. So what does he have to do? He's got to move. Yeah. And when he moves, so yeah. And if he doesn't move, he's, he's going to out of breath. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's incredible. Now, you're doing several things at the same time with this. By using the high mount, you're shutting down all the main avenues of escape. You're shutting down his ability to breathe. Yeah. And that's going to feed into the four submissions that I teach. You might be curious about this. I, you know, Jiu-Jitsu has yep. so many submissions. Yep. From out of position, I only teach four. So it's a very simple system. Okay? Yep. And once people learn it, um, it it's, as you always say, it seems simple in outline, but there's a lot of technical details. So yep. the, the video is yep. all about that. How, how, to, how to make this work no, against the best guys. The no, and the, it, just like the, this detail that you just showed, like the four fingers, it's not in the wrist, it's not in the hand, it's over yeah. here. Like, yeah. how, you know, like, it's so it, well calculated. Okay, you know, like, experimentation. Yeah. Think about it. Let's go through this, if you can slide down, Plus, yeah. Um, You know, you, you, you want to be effective with these things, and yep. so you, you start experimenting in the gym. And this is all many years ago. And you find you have a strong opponent. If you grab the short end of the lever, you find you just can't move them. Yeah. So then you go, okay, let me get the end of the lever. The short end didn't work, let me get the end of the lever. And the guy starts bending his wrist, and then you just slip off. Yep. And you go, okay, well, yep. what if I go somewhere in between? And then for the first time, you suddenly find it's very, very sticky. You use enough of the lever to get a reaction. You also start to discover that you never just push with the hand. Rather, your head leads the way. You also start to discover that if my elbow stays high, I'll never move them. Yep. But if my elbow goes low, I'll always move them. You're right, it's easy. And from here, you lock. And you get to work. Yeah, that's incredible, John. Yeah. So yeah. that leads into the four submissions that we look at. And then we look at the fail-safe options. That if the system fails and breaks down, then we've got fail-safe. 
that backup. You've got to have a backup because at yeah. World Championship level, nothing ever breaks through every single time. Yeah, no, I and agree. Um, even Hodger and Gordon had days they couldn't finish from the mouth. Yeah. So you got to have a backup. So the video is actually one of my favorites. And um, yeah, no, I agree. Like, you know, I tell you, like, this was the I have learned a lot of things from Warren. That detail was one of the details that yes. I got the most fascinated by because it, it's really hard to and you know it's funny control uh, the like mouth. I, I, I literally still remember the day uh, Gordon was in the, the basement and he goes like, dude, I can't move this guy's arm. What do I do? And I said, cross the wrist. Yeah, he told me. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he, like, he literally submitted, I think like 25 people, including two world champions from Mount that day. Like the yeah, day he did it. I was yeah. just like, dude, this is insane. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very easy to implement. And yeah. the system overall is extremely simple. It's actually far simpler, for example, than the leg lock system, which takes yeah. quite a bit of time. No, and you know, everything you said makes a lot of sense because yeah, I agree with one million percent. I go, on an NBA, mount is great. Yes. Then if gi, the still, grids, still, still pretty good. That's really good. Still and then good. no gi, if you don't know what yeah. you're doing, it's, it's it, almost it, bad. Like. Yeah. In fact, I, I think you'll agree with me, Bernardo, most athletes today don't really use the mount. Yeah. Because they're, they're like, hey, if I can't oh, hit the guy and I can't use a car, Joe, if I'm training, I guess you're a student, so I don't want to get yeah, one. Because like, you can yeah. get heel hooks. Yeah. So, you know, like, um, and, and even if you were in a place where there were no heel hooks, you'd still be like, well, why would I? It's, it's not as stable as side control. Yeah. Um, there's more, the, the escapes are generally easy to perform. Yeah. And I have less submission holes to work with. Yeah. Why would I get mounted? Yeah. And the answer, Bernardo, is because the mount is the only thing where you can directly attack your opponent's breathing. Okay. Through the nose and the mouth, and when, I'm not talking about silly attacks like this kind of thing. That's where it's yeah. No, it's like yeah, it's so no, you could hear the yeah, glasses voice yeah. over there. Like when, when you do it with your whole chest, it's like a freaking suction cup over your mouth and nose. And, yeah. and as I said, even in a state of relaxation, it's unpleasant. Forget about when you're deep into a match and you've been fighting like a dog for ten minutes, fifteen minutes, yeah. and, and now when someone shuts off your breathing, it's like, <coughs> like it's terrible. No, um, I agree. So seeing this light, Bernardo, I'm confident that students will be able to learn from this and start to yeah, double no, their effectiveness no, from no, mount position. Yeah, no, I have no doubts that the no gi mount in general is going to get better yes. after this video. Yeah, which is your goal. Thank so you. yeah, so guys, this is the seventh part of the new wave series, and it's going to be at bjjfanatics.com. Maybe by the time you're watching, it's already there. So make sure to check that out. And I'm super excited about this one person because uh, uh, it's really fascinating, like how 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 much room there is to improve in the no game out, you know. Yeah. Like, so I think that's the the point. It was Placido. It was John. Thank you. Please help me out to grow my YouTube channel. Just click subscribe, and to watch more videos, just click under see more videos. I hope you enjoyed. BJJFanatics.com. Use the promo code YouTubeFaria to get 10% off any instructional video. Improve your jujitsu faster.